I'm going to be talking to Shijo Zhou, who is the Vice President and Managing Director, Global Power and Renewables for S&P Global Commodity Insights. And he's the co-author of the report, Back to the Fundamentals, How the Russia-Ukraine War Reduces Emissions in Global Power Consumption. That sounds like a bit counterintuitive based on sort of the popular narrative, but uh, the data says otherwise. So welcome to the interview, uh, Shijo. Thank you for the invite, Markham. Now, the we're in a different uh, spot today than we were a year ago because the uh, uh, it, uh, both uh, oil and gas prices are are skyrocketing, uh, elect, and that's changed the the fuel mix in the global electric uh, power sector. Uh, kind of give us an overview of your paper, uh, if you will. Yeah, so it really came from the impetus. I think that uh, we've been talking about this focus on fossil fuel security, right, since the Russian-Ukraine conflict started. Um, and we wanted to take a look at what's really happened since the conflict began in the power renewable sector, which is uh, what my group uh, watches. And we have researchers all over the world monitoring their local markets. So that's where it really started. And at the half year mark, we decided to take a look at the actual data coming out of different parts of the world. And what surprised us a little bit and uh, in hindsight, probably shouldn't, is the fact that coal-fired generation has actually declined globally since the beginning of the, the conflict. And when you say it's declined, is this up to, uh, is, does the data go to the end of the summer, to the end of August? Uh, when, when does the data uh, end? Yeah, it's the first half of the year. So from January to the end of June, uh, and when we look at the data, it's very uh, apparent that the, the, the leaders in coal-fired power generation reduction, right, these are the people that reduce the most, are China and the United States. The only region where we saw some uh, coal-fired power generation growth was Europe and to a lesser extent India. Uh, but the decline in America, in China, and in Southeast Asia, the rest of the world, uh, more than offset the increases in Europe. And of course, like everybody talks about the increase in German coal-fired power generation, right? That's in the headline. We know that they're delaying coal plant retirement because of the crisis, uh, but European coal consumption is only 5% of global. So that impact is not nearly as big as what the rest of the world is doing, which is record high pro coal, pri coal prices driving down to the end. Now, there's a the popular narrative here, uh, Shiju, uh, is is that the uh, Chinese uh, the China is building uh, more and more and more coal plants. Uh, other countries like um, Vietnam, for instance, are also building coal. Uh, some of the countries are, are building coal uh, sponsored or financed by China under the Belt and Road Initiative. But it sounds like that narrative has is now been turned on its head. Yes, uh, uh, there's some nuance here, right? So there's there's building coal plants that are sitting there, and then there's actually burning the coal that would emit the carbon. What we're seeing in the first half of the year is that because coal prices are so high, that people simply are not burning as much coal. Uh, and that's sort of what most people would think when things are more expensive, you use less of it. Uh, now. China is still building more coal domestically, but the president of China last year did pledge that they will no longer build coal plants overseas. So we're seeing a drying up of coal plant financing in Southeast Asia, for example, in Vietnam, in the Philippines, et cetera. So that has also happened since the conflict in Ukraine started. We see less money going to coal-fired power uh, development uh, in addition to plants burning less coal. Now let's talk about renewable generation because it increased by 17% year over year, led by the US at 22% and China by 19%. Those are significant growth rates. Do we expect them to continue in those two countries? And will we see uh, significant renewable growth outside of those two? Sure, it's, uh, it's a trend that we expect will definitely continue. Uh, partly because, look, we have the Inflation Reduction Act that just got passed here in the U.S. It's you know, the most important climate legislation in the generation 
in China, they just released their 14th five-year plan, which doubled down on renewables again. And so we're expecting to see renewable numbers actually accelerating from this point on. The latest numbers we're seeing in the pipeline uh, in terms of development projects um, are very strong, uh, so strong that the worry now is whether or not there's enough supply chain to manufacture all of these solar panels and wind turbines and batteries um, that are needed to, to actually support this growth. Yeah, I, I'm looking at your, your numbers here and the, the share of coal in new project development pipeline went from 27% last year to only 10% today. That's really an extraordinary decline, but the amount of wind and solar just in China alone went from 144 gigawatts uh, up to 320 gigawatts. I think that gives us an idea of the scale at which this is being wrapped up. That's right. The, the, the pipeline number you mentioned was Southeast Asia, right? Of course, we know Asia is where 90% of the new coal is being built these days. So to see that the, the share of coal in Southeast Asia dropping from 27 to 10%, it's pretty amazing. And it involved cancellation of many coal projects the past year. Uh, and in China, it's, it's, uh, the story has been that they continue to charge ahead with the renewables ambitions. So between China, US, and, and Europe, we're talking two thirds of global renewables additions. Uh, and all three regions are really uh, putting down even more investment dollars and government support behind it. Uh, I, have a, I have a hypothesis I'd like to run by you. Uh, and the hypothesis is this. Uh, over the last 10 or 15 years, China has clearly taken a lead in the clean energy economy. It's got, you know, 80% of solar manufacturing and 77% and of battery manufacturing capacity and, and so on and so forth. And I think the Americans have finally woken up that, that, that there's a new, a big shift in uh, industry and, and in the economy taking place, and, and they missed the boat. China is now well ahead of them. And the U.S., uh, the Inflation Reduction Act is basically their commitment to catch up. Biden said in 2020 that he was going to catch, they were going to catch China by 2030. And all of that then, of course, requires more renewables. What, what do you think make of that hypothesis? I, I, I more or less agree with you, Markham. I think it's a catch up game that the U.S. is playing, especially when it comes to manufacturing, especially considering that you know, in, in places like solar and wind, the U.S. is importing a lot more of the equipment, right? So there is a sense that the manufacturing of this clean energy supply chain should be localized back at home um, or in friendly countries, as uh, folks in D.C. would often say. But we do need more manufacturing supply chains to be built out to make sure that we can actually meet the demand for all of the new uh, renewable growth worldwide, uh, not just in China, not in, just in the US. There are many more emerging markets where this is needed. And it's helped actually uh, this, this, this competition, right? Everybody builds more manufacturing. That's the China story for the past 10 years for solar. It lowered the cost of solar panels for everybody. And so if we could continue with that build, with that manufacturing innovation, then we could perhaps could lower this cost even more for not just solar, for batteries, for other new technologies uh, that are needed to scale up uh, clean energy. So if I understand this correctly, I mean, let's, let's follow the sort of extrapolate on my hypothesis a little bit. So let's say that the U.S. is successful over the next decade in building up its supply chains around clean energy technologies like batteries and EVs and wind and solar. And, 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 it, and, and it is able to uh, basically now take over China's role more or less in its domestic economy. Does that mean then that, you know, China and the U.S., maybe Europe, maybe Japan, they begin uh, competing uh, hard in some of these emerging markets like uh, India and Latin America and, and you know, the, some of the low-income economies? Is that sort of the post-2030 world we're looking at? Yeah, I mean, that, I don't think we're going to wait until 2030, right? Today, we already uh, are seeing renewables being built everywhere else as well. Uh, and for example, the Chinese are building solar manufacturing factories in Southeast Asia already today. Uh, and 
in fact, some of those panels are being shipped to the U.S. to circumvent some of the, the, the tariffs that the Trump administration put in. Uh, now, this kind of um, competition for markets, in our view, is generally pretty healthy, right? Whoever can be the most efficient and build the lowest cost, uh, the best technology, and share it with the whole rest of the world, then those should be the technologies that win. That's sort of our lessons from free trade. And, uh, and that's certainly good news for other countries that are looking to scale up as well. I was reading an article, uh, it was this morning actually, that uh, argued that uh, the, what the US should do, and this of course has uh, big implications for Canada, is not try to just catch up with uh, China on uh, the existing clean energy technologies like lithium ion batteries. The, the, what it, the US does really well is innovate. And so what it should be doing is spending a lot of money and, and, and resources innovating the next generation of, of, uh, of batteries, for instance. So, so it might be, you know, aluminum, aluminum, lithium, aluminum, or I, I, there are all kinds of chemistries out there uh, that are that are under development and look promising. And, and then that, in fact, is the way the U.S. leapfrogs over China is is the next generation of these technologies. What do you make of that argument? Uh, I think the U.S. in many ways are already doing it, right? In the in the area of hydrogen, for example, uh, the latest legislation has a lot of money set aside for hydrogen, uh, what they call these hydrogen hubs set up by the Department of Energy here. Um, so there's a lot of that, I think, will become uh, much more widespread over time. There's also questions about, for example, small modular nuclear reactors, right? Fourth generation nuclear reactors that are very important part of the, the net zero technology menu um, that the US is also developing. So yeah, there's definitely a sense that there are new technologies maybe, you know, that's maybe two decades away that we still need to tackle while we have some of the existing technologies that we can scale up and make cheaper. Uh, my final question for you, Shijo. Uh, it I remember in 27, 2018 thinking, uh, you know, you could feel the energy transition accelerating at that point. And then by 2019, it was very clear that that things were were moving much quiet, faster, costs were dropping, so on and so forth. And it looks like now that the pandemic and plus Russia invading Ukraine has further accelerated that that uh, uh, the energy transition. And Given the things that we've talked about, and this has big implications for renewable adoption versus coal, for in, in instance, but it seems like we're just the, the the pedal is to the metal, and the the speed at which we're we're hurtling into this new future is is something we couldn't have imagined a couple of years ago. Do you expect that to continue that trend? Yeah, I think I was a little bit surprised too by the momentum that we gather the past two years, right? You go to the UN meetings, you have world leaders now pledging, you know, one after another on net zero. Uh, we didn't think China and India were going to come on and then they joined as well, the pledges. So that's definitely gathered a lot of speed and we're seeing, you know, ESG becoming such an important investment driver that uh, if you talk to companies in Southeast Asia, I was just talking to a few of those uh, two days ago, they simply can't find any financing anymore for any coal plants at all uh, from, from any major financial institutions. Uh, in fact, the companies that used to build coal plants doing all the engineering and construction work, they've said, we're not gonna do it anymore. You know, We're gonna do, start doing hydrogen plants. We're gonna start doing uh, wind, we're doing transmission. So it, it is, becoming harder and harder, even if you want to have a coal plant, becoming much harder. Uh, now, the concern I have right now is that when we gather this kind of speed, uh, the electric power system in particular uh, is so large and it's got such a heavy transmission and network component to it. And we require very high reliability for our electric supply. We're adding more and more of variable resources, what we call wind and solar, right? And traditionally the grid generally managed only firm capacity that are dispatchable anytime you can call on them. And that there's flexibility provided by gas turbines. We're not adding a whole lot of those technologies today. And of course, people talk about batteries, people talk about other sources, right? Uh, 
they haven't scaled up to the point that they can replace all of the existing, what we call coal plants, nuclear, all of the firm traditional capacity yet. So there is a smooth transition idea that needs to be thought through more um, thoroughly, if you will. Um, and this is why in California, you're, you're now seeing the governor saying that we're going to perhaps extend the life of uh, Diablo Canyon nuclear plant, which they had wanted to retire. Uh, they realized that we still need some of these resources to transition us uh, into that clean future. Well, Shijo, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate your insights. I, I think I often say uh, in the Canadian context that we just don't appreciate in this country how fast the global energy system is transitioning away from the status quo that we've been used to for 100 years. And uh, our conversation today, I think, kind of drove that home. So thank you very much for this. Thank you.